For those that don't know me, I'm Andrew Gilbert. I'm the director of the Air Power Development Centre. Thank you for, very much for coming. This is one of our series of monthly seminars, and it gives me great pleasure to introduce Lieutenant General Larry D. James. He joined the US Air Force after graduating from the US Academy in 1978. Um, he completed a master's degree at MIT in 93 and graduated in the top 10% of his Air War College course in 1993. He had a wide uh, variety of uh, postings in operations, intel, acquisition projects, and he also uh, was a space shuttle payload specialist and has held command at every level within his Air Force. He was the senior space officer during Operation Iraqi Freedom, and he served with um, our previous Chief of Air Force, um, Jeff Brown. He's also served within US Space Command and uh, Air Force Space Command. Um, Lieutenant General Larry James was the Deputy Chief of ISR for the US Air Force, and he had an ISR staff bigger than our Air Force. Um, his post-Air Force career in space has been just as impressive, and it's been included on the, uh, the handout we gave. And um, he's uh, kindly volunteered to stay afterwards for a Q&A that has to be out here no later than uh, 10 past 11. So um, I'll hand over to you, Great. sir, and thank you very much for uh, coming. Thanks. Well, good morning. Wow, good morning. <laughs> Pretty quiet. You didn't have your coffee or what? So uh, uh, obviously, uh, you see the title of my talk, Space for the Warfighter and Space for Science. That's kind of the two bookends of my career, if you will. So I'm going to start off talking a little bit about just how we do space in the military side of things for the U.S. Air Force and the Joint Force at the, in the U.S. And frankly, as you probably have read and know, uh, that's kind of undergoing a lot of change right now. So I can't guarantee you that the slides I have are even correct anymore uh, in terms of organization and structure. But the general ideas are still the same. Uh, but you've probably heard about going to the Space Force uh, in the U.S. military would be another branch of the armed services, so uh, that will be an interesting uh, path forward, and I'm happy to talk about that. I have opinions. I don't have any authority uh, at this point. But, uh, and then I'll segue a little bit into just some of the things we're doing at JPL, uh, which relates to kind of the, the cool technology and missions we're doing, and then I'll kind of finish up. Uh, looking at a particular area of, of small sats and cube sats and some of the technologies we're developing there, but I'm happy to go down any path you want to go down in terms of dialogue and conversation and questions. So uh, that's kind of where we'll be going. Uh, I think I start off with a video about JPL. It's very self-serving. I'll admit that up front. It talks about the culture of innovation at JPL. So uh, actually, that's <coughs> later in the briefing. Sorry. We'll start with the military side. So. Uh, uh, Gave a little bit of background of my history, but uh, just some of the, the key areas uh, for me. So uh, this was uh, our wing, 50th Space Wing, uh, at Schriever Air Force Base, which really does all of our satellite command and control. So as an 06, I was the commander there and responsible for you know, satellite command and control, MILSTAR, DMSP, GPS, other classified missions, and so on and so forth. So. Uh, and then uh, as a three-star, I was, uh, this is a joint-hatted organization. It was uh, Joint Forces Component Command Space under U.S. STRATCOM, and then 14th Air Force Commander, which is the Air Force component for JFCC Space. So uh, that was the dual hat I wore at Vandenberg Air Force Base, uh, really responsible for all U.S. military space operations and capabilities. Uh, so that's a little bit about uh, that. And then uh, I just thought I'd throw in some cool pictures of you know, I did wear a uniform at one time, so I had to at least put some pictures of me in a uniform. Uh, this was uh, over in Afghanistan, uh, talking to some of our ISR guys. Uh, I don't even know where that was, but this is the JSPOC. Uh, we've had Australians there in the Joint Space Operations Center for many years, uh, and that's been a key component of really helping to build that coalition uh, capability for space situational awareness and those sorts of things. But um, uh, so that's just a brief picture history, if you will. But in terms of how do we organize, how do we put all this together, and as I said, this is now kind of a very fluid environment. Things are changing. Some of these have already changed, but at least give you the big picture in terms of, uh, you know, we have strategic command, which is uh, the unified command the com the, that's responsible for 
a lot of things, our ICBMs, both sub submarine and airborne and in the holes. Uh, so that's Global Strike is the joint component there, but also space, that's the Had I War, uh, Cybercom, et cetera, information <coughs> operations, ISR. So you can see STRATCOM has this huge level of responsibility in terms of managing these various components. But a key component was the space component uh, under STRATCOM. And then from the JFCC space perspective, uh, you really had just a multiple set of, I would call them customers, or, or people you had to work with, support, whatever the case may be. So you had a host of U.S. government agencies that relied on uh, military space capabilities that you had to work with and support. Uh, you had all the various component commands under STRATCOM that you would work with to develop unified capabilities, unified plans, depending on the mission and the operation. Uh, then, of course, you had the support of the other COCOMs because STRATCOM in many ways exists to support the warfighting efforts of other COCOMs unless we're going into a nuclear context and then they would be the supporting commander. Uh, but otherwise, we're often in the role of supporting the other combatant commanders, and I've got a slide on that coming up. And then, uh, you know, within JSCC space, we had various operational units that reported into that unified command of JSCC space, whether it's the Navy folks, the Army folks, uh, the Air Force with their space operations squadron, the space warfare squadrons, and so on. So it was, and then you had relationships with foreign governments and foreign space agencies, i.e. the Australians or the French or whoever, especially on the space situational awareness side to make sure that we're providing information to them. And then there is relationship with commercial space entities because they provide space data as well. Uh, and they also provide capability for space situational awareness. So it's a very multifaceted organization, multifaceted relationships, and I think as Australia grows its space capabilities, that will be true as well, because space is this overarching capability that supports multiple entities, not only civilian, but uh, military. And as I said, uh, how do we synchronize space operations? That's a key thing that uh, the component commander is responsible for. Uh, so essentially you have a combatant commander who identifies, hey, this is what I need. I need GPS, I need communications, I need ISR, I need pictures, whatever the case may be. And those things come into our Joint Space Operations Center uh, and that's really modeled on a standard KOC uh, that we have or a JOC depending on uh, the structure. But we take those requirements and we develop task plans and those sorts of things to task our forces to support the warfighter. And then, of course, we have a relationship uh, with uh, the Joint Force Component Commanders and his control center. And we had something called a Space Coordinating Authority. That's the individual that's really assigned to the Joint Force Component Commander to make sure that all these things are being coordinated and ultimately the combatant commander's requirements are being met. And then Often dual hat is, is the director of space forces, which is the individual that sets in the KOC or the JOC or, uh, or whatever it may be, the AOC, to ensure that all this is working correctly, understands the, the uh, AOC, understands the, the task plans, understands uh, what's happening and making sure that uh, this linkage is working very well. And this is the role I played in OIF. Uh, uh, out at Prince Sultan Air Base when we were uh, conducting operations in Iraq for Iraqi freedom. So that's uh, kind of ultimately how we generate effects in the battle space is to have that joint force component commander that has all these capabilities that he can bring to the combined forces commander and execute the mission that's levied upon them. Uh, and that, even though, frankly, some of the names may change, some of the organization names may change over time, in general, that's how we operate. So even as we create a space force, um, that is, uh, they will still be required to kind of have this structure and operation in support of the combatant commander. And like I said, that's still a work in progress, so nobody knows exactly how that's going to sort out. So uh, I just thought I'd hit a couple things. Uh, so what does space for the warfighter mean? Uh, Certainly, as I've just talked about, you want to make sure that assets are available uh, for the combined commander 
and that you synchronize those capabilities with his requirements and his operations. I would say that's kind of job one in terms of uh, how that all has to come together. And then uh, making sure that if there are threats, we respond to those threats. Uh, and I remember that uh, uh, there were a bunch of jammers being used in Iraq uh, during Iraqi freedom and the, uh, uh, the CFAC was very uh, worried about those and that was a high priority for him to go take those out, uh, which we did. Uh, so those are the types of things that we work with the intelligence communities and those sorts of things to kind of understand where are they, uh, when are they coming on, when are they going off, how are they operating, and how we can go take them out. So making sure that we respond to those threats, whether they're ground-based or space-based. And of course, uh, you know, in the, in the defense world, obviously there's a lot of concern about threat capabilities of other nations who shall remain, remain nameless in this segue, but uh, uh, we do pay a lot of attention to that. And then, as I talked about, uh, serving as that liaison as the Director of Space Forces uh, for the combatant commander is an important role. And certainly, space situational awareness is uh, a lot of uh, capability that people talk about today. Um, we've signed a lot of partnership agreements with various nations. In fact, I just read last week there was another one signed. I don't remember who it was with now. But to essentially share data about what's going on in space. Uh, and we can do that at the unclassified level and with the right partners we can do that at the classified level so that there is this awareness of the battle space in space, not just in air and not just on the ground. Uh, so that's a very important uh, component. And you may remember the Iridium Cosmos collision back in roughly 2011 or 12. I was actually the commander at 14th Air Force when that happened. So uh, kind of the first time we've ever had this unpredicted collision which got a lot of people excited and we had the White House on the line and STRATCOM on the line and all those sorts of things because it was a big deal creating this whole debris path out there in space that, uh, that we had not uh, planned on. And then uh, again, international partnerships are gonna become even more and more important. Uh, they're important on the Department of Defense side, they're important on the civil space side and, and how we bring all this together uh, from an international perspective uh, you know, as each nation continues to grow its space capabilities, uh, it will be important that we manage that just as we manage the integration of air power uh, across uh, the operational space. So that's kind of a big picture overview of, of how we operate, how we integrate our forces, um, and, and some of the, the things we try to make sure we do well. Uh, but international partnership is definitely going to be uh, more and more important as time goes on. So. Uh, we can talk anything about that as we come to the end and have Q&A time. That's really where we can have a lot of uh, good dialogue there. So uh, I think I'm gonna move from there to now my current job. Uh, and I know you think a lot about innovation and technology and how do we bring those types of capabilities to bear on the problem sets you have in the defense forces. Uh, so I'll try to highlight some of the innovative things that we do from a science perspective at JPL, but frankly, a lot of the things we do uh, can have direct applicability to defense problems, uh, whether it's cool sensors, uh, miniaturization, um, how do you handle big data, uh, all those things have often a one-to-one -one relationship with uh, problems in the Department of Defense. And we actually do work at JPL, not just for NASA, but for the Army, for the Air Force, uh, for other communities uh, that uh, take our technology and apply them to the problems that the DOD has. So uh, next up is my video. It's very self-serving. It's all about JPL and the culture of innovation and what does it take to have that culture of innovation uh, and really give your people the freedom to be very innovative. So I'm going to play this and uh, it's about two minutes long so you'll see what JPL is all about. What does JPL do? It's the most unique place to work on Earth. Our charter is to do things no one has done before. We do what no one else even does to dream about. Imagination and innovation are crucial in being able to do the kind of work that we do. Innovation comes from people, but it also, I think, comes from structure and from the environment. If you can provide people with the appropriate tools, the appropriate workspace, the appropriate environments, you're also going to get a higher innovation output. 
One of the things that makes the JPL environment so special to work in is that even when you first walk on lab, it feels like a campus. And you walk around, you hear people talking about their work. What would be the best way to get a subsurface vehicle beneath the ice of Europa? And you're thinking, those people aren't just talking about it because they saw it on a movie somewhere. It's because they're really trying to figure out how to do it. So just a brief snippet, but um, we all think about innovation. We all think about doing things differently. We all think about, frankly, how do we stay ahead of the threat and how do we harness this new technology. And, and I would offer that uh, the folks at JPL are pretty good at that. Um, that is kind of our charter, to do things that no one else has done and figure out how to do it. And uh, it is a pretty exciting place. So I'll just talk a little bit about some of the things that are going on, just a little bit of history. Um, <clears throat> We are a part of Caltech. So if you're familiar with Caltech, it's kind of one of the world's premier educational institutions. In fact, uh, two weeks ago, they just won another Nobel Prize in chemistry. Uh, Caltech has more Nobel Prize winners per professor capita than any other academic institution in the world. So uh, they won the Nobel Prize last year in physics for LIGO, the gravity wave detection system that they built. So uh, that is our heritage and, and, and I'm paid by Caltech, you know, we are Caltech people that are under contract to NASA uh, to do all these cool things for NASA. But we started back in uh, 1936 trying to figure out how to develop rockets and build rockets before people knew how to did that, do that. And this is a group we affectionately call the Suicide Squad. Uh, they're the first folks that uh, were trying to figure out how to build rockets. Uh, literally they were doing that in the labs down at Caltech in the middle of Pasadena and they kept blowing doors off and windows out and walls down and the administration finally said, please move. And so they moved up to the Arroyo there in the San Gabriel Mountains, which is where JPL is located today, built a couple of shacks, put up some you know, sandbags around a test stand and tried to figure out how do you build rockets. Uh, so that's where we started, that's our heritage. And then uh, because of that research that we were doing, we were really the nation's experts in rocketry when World War II came along. So at that point in time, the Army took us over and said, we need you to develop rockets for the war effort. So that's what we did in the 40s. So we developed things like the WAC Corporal and the Sergeant Missile and the Private Missile, and, and we developed JATO. Anybody know what JATO is? Jet Assisted Takeoff. That's where we get our name, Jet Propulsion Lab, because we were the guys working on and developing JATO and developed that and proved that we could do it. Uh, we don't build jets anymore at JPL. Uh, we don't even build rockets anymore. We build spacecraft to go out and do exploration, but we kept the name because that's how people know us. And then uh, you see this iconic photo here. Uh, obviously Sputnik launched in the mid-50s. That got everyone's attention. And the U.S., of course, wanted to respond. Kind of the space race was on. And so uh, JPL built uh, the United States' first satellite, Explorer 1. So a uh, pretty iconic picture, as I said. This was after the successful launch of Explorer 1 in January 31st, 1958. That's Dr. Bill Pickering, who was the head of JPL at the time. Uh, that's Dr. James Van Allen, from whom the Ballin Allen belts are named after because a little experiment we had on the spacecraft discovered the Van Allen <coughs> radiation belts. And, uh, and then that's uh, Werner von Braun, who helped build the rocket that got us up into space. So that's you know, really our heritage. And in fact, we did all this, and NASA didn't even exist at the time. Uh, it was a few months later, on October 1st in 1958, that NASA was created. And then they asked if JPL would become a part of NASA, and we said, well, we're not going to become a part of the government, but we'll, we'll be your federally funded research and development center, as we call them, FFRDC. So that's what we are today. We're a research and development center funded primarily by NASA and some Department of Defense, uh, but we're still Caltech. Uh, we, we run the lab. And of course, you can see things that we go do, Mars, looking out into the universe, and a lot of Earth science. So uh, we'll touch on some of those as we go forward. So, uh, yeah, the key areas we work in, uh, just kind of starting with the Earth, we do a lot of missions that look down at the Earth. Uh, and you can imagine that's not only important for science, but for defense purposes. Uh, we then go to the planets, Mars as being the key planet that we focus a lot of energy on, but we also go to the outer planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, etc. cetera. Uh, then we also look out beyond the solar system uh, with big telescopes that we put up in space. Uh, to uh, understand the origin of the universe, are there planets around other stars, all those kind of things. Uh, we currently have uh, 23 spacecraft uh, and eight instruments uh, in orbit that we operate. Uh, everything from the Voyager spacecraft, uh, 
which are humanity's first interstellar spacecraft. Voyager 1 has left the solar system. Uh, to a lot of Earth science, these are microwave radar science uh, missions that measure ocean height, missions on Mars. I'll touch on some of these as we go forward. But, uh, uh, so we have a whole host of spacecraft that we operate around the Earth and throughout the solar system and beyond. This is just one of our recent missions, uh, so I want to just highlight some of that. Um, in the month of May of this year, uh, JPL had their busiest launch month in our history. Uh, we put seven payloads up in space in one month. Uh, so we were very busy with uh, getting those going and checking them out. This is one of those missions. This is a mission that measures gravity. Uh, and you think, well, how do you measure gravity? And I think I've got a little video, let's see, that talks about that, so, or shows it at least. So it's really two spacecraft that fly in formation and we measure the distance between them extremely accurately. We have a test, la a new laser system on this set of spacecraft. We can measure the distance between them down to one nanometer. So a millionth of a meter is how accurately we're measuring the distance between these two spacecraft. And so they fly in formation about 40 to 50 miles apart. And how they measure gravity is, and you'll see with the little video, but when they come over, let's say uh, the Alps or Mount Everest, the gravity will pull the front spacecraft forward a little faster uh, and the rear spacecraft won't see that effect until it gets closer. So you'll actually see that the distance between the two spacecraft increases as it comes over this large mass of a mountain. And then as the second spacecraft flies over that large mass, it speeds up and catches up. And then they'll fly over another mass and the distance changes. So that's literally how we measure gravity change is by measuring the distance between the two state spacecraft and the change in distance is caused by the different levels of gravity that are underneath the spacecraft. So, uh, and then we are able to make these different maps that show red is where the gravity has gotten lower, if you will. Uh, blue will be the gravity has gotten increased over time. And you say, well, how does that happen? Well, you look at things like, if you look at Greenland, you'll see that over time, uh, the gravity has decreased because the glaciers are melting. So there's less mass there, therefore there's less gravity, and we can detect that change. And if I go back to the, uh, that slide, we actually can detect the change in the water level in our aquifers in California. So this is uh, California, this is the Central Valley, kind of the, the key area where we do a lot of agriculture and growing crops. And because uh, there's been drought off and on over the last decade and a half, uh, there's a lot of water that's being pumped out of the aquifer in the ground. And so over time, green indicates good, red indicates less mass, less gravity, and the reality is less water. So we can actually calibrate and tell the, the scientists how much water has been taken out of the aquifer just by the fact that the gravity has changed. So uh, that's one application of something like that. So uh, very important not only for just understanding uh, this type of thing, but really overall, how's the globe changing uh, from a gravity and mass perspective? So we'll skip that. Um, I talked about Mars as being an important component of what we do. Uh, this is our latest mission to Mars. We launched, that's one of the missions we launched in May on May 5th. It will land on November 26th. Uh, in the U.S., that's the Monday after Thanksgiving, which we call Cyber Monday because it's a big shopping day, all the sales are on the Monday after Thanksgiving and people go back to work and they get on their computer and start shopping instead of working. So uh, that's Cyber Monday. Uh, we'll be landing on the surface at about 6.43 a.m. here, Australian time, as I recall. Uh, I think that'll be November 27th for you. Uh, but its mission, it's not a rover, it doesn't drive around on the surface, it just lands, stays in one place. Uh, but it's really to understand the interior of Mars. So uh, we don't really know a lot about the core of Mars, how big is it, how warm is it, you know, what's its evolution and so on, how does it impact the planet and its history. So we've got two key instruments. One is a seismometer that when it's landed, it'll be up here on the flight deck, but then we'll take this robotic arm and bring it down and place it on the surface. Uh, and that will measure, you know, Mars quakes. And, and when we get those kind of things happening, or if a meteor hits on the other side, we'll measure as the the wave transmits through the whole planet, we can measure that, and that tells us a lot about the size of the core and those sorts of things. And then we've got this penetrator, this mole we call it, it actually bangs its way down below the surface, about six meters, and when you're that far down below the surface, any heat that you're getting is coming from the core of the planet. It's not coming from the solar exposure on the surface. 
So based on that, we can tell what the temperature of the core of the planet is. So those are the two key experiments that will be operating on that. There's some other ones, uh, but that's our latest mission to Mars. And I will say, you know, again, uh, somewhat pridefully, that JPL is the only organization on the planet that's ever landed successfully on Mars. So we're pretty proud of that. So the Europeans have tried, the Russians have tried, the British have tried, they've all failed. So, but it's all risky. I mean, every mission, you never know if it's going to work or not. So. And that's just a picture after we launched of the inside with the heat shield and the heat blanket. Oops. Uh, you know, just kind of a cool thing uh, on its way to Mars. So it's about a six-month journey to get out to Mars. And uh, I'll have a little section at the end on these small spacecraft CubeSats. And I know that uh, a lot of folks in Australia are starting to think about that. And I've talked to the Australian Space Agency folks about how they can leverage those sorts of things. Uh, these will be uh, the world's first interplanetary CubeSats. So these are CubeSats that we built, and I'll give you kind of a picture here to give you a sense of scale. Um, when InSight lands on Mars on November 26th, we have two communication spacecraft around Mars that relay data from our rovers back to Earth. But those communication satellites are not in position to relay the data from the InSight lander in real time back to the Earth. They'll take the data and store it, and then when they're in the right position, they'll relay the data. But that's about an hour after we land, and we wanted to see if we could get real-time data so that we know what's happening in real time as we're coming into the atmosphere of Mars and we're landing. So we developed these two CubeSats uh, called MARCO, uh, Mars Communications, and uh, they launched with InSight, and they're flying with InSight to Mars. And uh, essentially, it's just a radio receiver and a big antenna to send the data back to the Earth. So the InSight lander will communicate with uh, the Marcos CubeSats, and then they'll just uh, bent pipe that and relay that data back to Earth in real time. And both those spacecraft are, have checked out fine. They're operating fine, and they're flying on the right trajectory. They don't go into orbit around Mars. They just do kind of a flyby at the exact right time to be able to collect this telemetry data as we land. So uh, we're pretty excited about that. But you can see, as I said, the form factor is, you know, not very big, and they're not extremely expensive. But uh, at the latter end of my talk, I'll talk about, you know, the miniaturization of technology that allows us to do these kind of things. And again, you can think of a lot of other applicable missions that you can start to do things when you have small satellites. As I said, Mars is a big deal. This is just some of the latest findings. Uh, this was from a science paper published in the last few months about the fact that they found these complex organic molecules on the surface with our Curiosity rover. Uh, this is literally a selfie of the rover. Uh, we have a camera on the robotic arm that we can swing around 360 degrees and take pictures from all angles. Uh, then we stitch it back together to give you this picture. But that is a picture of the rover on the surface of Mars. So, um, you know, the real, the real mission why we go there with these rovers is to understand what was Mars like in the past. Uh, was it Earth-like or not? Uh, could there have been life there? Is there evidence of life there in the past? Is there evidence of life there today? And so with, with curiosity over its mission that's now um, six years ongoing, we have indeed found that there was large quantities of water on the surface of Mars in the past, and it was the type of water that could have supported life. So that's a pretty important finding over the last six years. And then uh, methane is a very important chemical because uh, products of life generate methane. Uh, you read about cows generating methane. <laughs> uh, but uh, so we've actually found evidence of methane being produced on Mars, and it's kind of in sync with the summer months it goes up, and then in the cooler months it goes down. Uh, scientists don't really know what the cause is. They don't think it's life causing it, but some kind of chemical reaction beneath the surface of the planet. But uh, that was just in a paper published this summer, uh, these findings about methane. And we have another rover on Mars called Opportunity. Uh, that mission started in 2004. Uh, we expected that rover to last 90 days. And it still, was still going up until uh, uh, we had a big dust storm. So uh, this is a planet-wide dust storm on Mars. It started at the beginning of the summer. Uh, Curiosity is solar powered. It has solar cells. Uh, so we rely on the sun to charge our batteries. The batteries then operate the rover and keep everything warm at the right temperature. But because of this dust storm, uh, we gradually had the sun blotted out. So this is just a bunch of time-phase pictures from the rover. 
That's the sun on a normal day. The dust storm starts to come in. It gets worse. It gets worse. It gets worse. And now you don't see the sun. And we were in that condition for several months without having any solar power into the rover. So uh, the dust storm has cleared up a fair amount. We've been trying to contact the rover for the last three or four weeks. So far, we've heard nothing. Uh, so there's a good chance that you know, the components actually froze and it's not going to recover. But there's also a chance that it's semi-okay, but there's still a bunch of dust on the solar panels. And there's a windy season in Mars that starts next month that could potentially blow the dust off the panels and we start to get solar energy back in. So we're going to keep trying for a few more months to see if it might be alive. But again, 14 years on an originally planned 90-day mission is, is not a bad mission. So, uh, um, one of the things that uh, we're proud of too is electric propulsion. This is a mission that went out to the asteroid belt. Uh, and there's the two largest asteroids are called, are called Dawn and Ceres. Uh, and so, it bit, I'm sorry, Vesta and Ceres. Dawn is the name of the spacecraft. And it visited both of those using its electric propulsion technology. So, you know, it's, it's a very low thrust. It takes you a while to get there, but you can keep thrusting long periods of time. So it's been under continuous thrust almost for eight or nine years. So we could visit this asteroid and then visit this asteroid. Uh, the largest asteroid, Ceres, is really a small planet. It's not a rock that you think about when you think about, of as think about asteroids. But it's actually got some incredible formations, and uh, uh, we've been flying about 22 miles above the surface over the last six months or so uh, and taking a lot of these very up-close pictures. But uh, we found that there's a lot of ice on this asteroid, which was something we didn't know before we went there. In fact, to the point where we've got these things called cryovolcanoes. This is really ice that has been pushed up into a cone-like structure like a volcano by the, the, just the heating and cooling of the asteroid. And over time, it creates these pressures and pushes it up. So uh, a lot of very interesting findings there. And of course, the, the, we'd like to go back there someday and actually land on the asteroid and do further exploration. Uh, moving out to the outer planets, this is our latest mission to Jupiter uh, called Juno. And uh, it put, went into orbit uh, July 4th, 2016, so it's been there a little over two years. And its mission is to really try to peer below the clouds and understand what's going on beneath that cloudy surface of Jupiter. What are the components, the chemical components of the atmosphere? Uh, what's the core like? Is it metallic hydrogen or not? Is it big? Is it small? Uh, things that we just don't know. So uh, a lot of good science coming out of that. And it's actually the first mission to fly over the poles of Jupiter. Our previous mission out to Jupiter was called Galileo, and it flew in an equatorial orbit. So these are some of the first pictures we've ever had of the polar regions of Jupiter. And you can see these incredible formations of clouds and storms and structures that uh, we frankly had never had a chance to see before at the polar regions of Jupiter. Our mission to Saturn was called Cassini. Uh, Cassini was an incredible mission, uh, operated around Saturn for over 12 years. Uh, doing incredible pictures and science and understanding. Uh, one of the findings there was Enceladus, the moon of Saturn, which has water on it. Um, you know, 25 years ago, we thought the Earth was the only place in the solar system that had water. Now we're finding that there's water that's frequent throughout the solar system. We saw a uh, series, that, that asteroid with ice, which can be turned into water. Enceladus is a moon of Saturn, which has a frozen icy surface, but beneath that icy surface is liquid water, and that liquid water actually jets up into space through these crevices that are in the southern polar region of the, of the moon Enceladus. And we took Cassini, the spacecraft, and flew it about 30 miles above the surface right through these jets and collected samples to see what are the components that are inside that water. So uh, that was a pretty incredible feat of navigation. This is just a little video. We had to destroy the spacecraft last September because we were running out of fuel. And this kind of depicts its final moments. We burned it into the atmosphere.
say, well, why did you burn it up in the atmosphere? Why didn't you just leave it orbiting? Because if we no longer could control it, there was some chance in the future that we could have hit one of the moons of Saturn. And because we didn't sterilize the spacecraft back when we built it 25 years ago, there theoretically could be Earth microbes that were still living, and therefore we could have contaminated one of those moons with Earth organisms. And so the decision was made, no, you've got to burn it up. So that's why we burned it into the atmosphere of Saturn. So uh, there's a whole office at NASA called the Planetary Protection Office that worries about that stuff. They don't worry about aliens attacking us, but they worry about those kind of things. These are just some of our future Earth missions uh, looking down at the Earth. This is called Surface Water and Ocean Topography. It's actually a, a radar satellite. It's got two radar beams here and here. Uh, and the unique thing about this that we've not done before is it's going to use radar interferometry. Uh, with our normal ocean height measuring spacecraft that we fly today, it's a microwave radar. It just beams a signal down. It bounces back. You measure the time, and it tells you the height of the ocean. Uh, this will use the interference of those radar beams to give us much more information about ocean currents, as well as our ability to monitor height of freshwater bodies like rivers and lakes and reservoirs, which we can't do with a typical microwave radar because you don't get the reflectivity off the freshwater. So uh, that mission we're building right now and will launch in 2021. And of course, one of the big challenges is you've got to precisely align these radar beams so you get the exact interferometric interference patterns that you want to get and to keep those things aligned alike to microns uh, on orbit. So that's been a challenge, but we're moving forward with that. Uh, this is another radar mission. It's another synthetic aperture radar in the L-band and S-band. This is a joint program with India. This is the first time we've actually had a big joint program with the Indian Space Research Organization. Uh, and that will allow us to measure change in biomass, measure change in shoreline, measure change in glaciers and <coughs> ice, ice pack and those sorts of things using both the L-band and S-band uh, synthetic aperture radar. So uh, that'll be very useful for just crop management and understanding what's going on with the shorelines and those sorts of things. And then we're going to go back to Mars in 2020. Uh, this is our next big rover that we're building. Uh, it will have many more precise instruments in the current rover to look for signs of life, but also one of its key components is to take samples that we're going to put in these small tubes and store them on the surface of the planet. And then ultimately, in the mid-20s, we send a mission back to pick those tubes up and bring them back to Earth to analyze them on Earth. So it's the first step of what we call a Mars sample return mission. And we're also going to, for you Air Force folks, have the first aeronautical vehicle on another planet. So we're building the Mars helicopter. So this is actually a helicopter that will fly along with the rover. It'll be in a little pan underneath here when we land. And then we'll deploy the helicopter onto the ground and the rover will move away. Uh, and uh, it will, it's really a, a, a demonstration and a test to prove that we can do this. Uh, it's solar, it's got solar cells, it's got a battery. The battery provides the power to operate it. It will, it's only about two and a half kilograms, not very big, uh, but we'll have a high definition camera on board and it will fly out in front of the rover and give us a view of what's ahead uh, beyond what the rover can see with its existing cameras. And so uh, uh, this is really just to demonstrate this technology and we'll continue to improve on that. But does anybody know how thick the Mars atmosphere is? 1%. It's 1% of the Earth's atmosphere, so well over 100,000 feet if you're on the Earth, uh, way up there. So trying to even figure out can you build a helicopter that would operate in a 1% atmosphere was a challenge. Uh, this was our kind of our engineering model that we worked out to say, yeah, can we really do this? And then we actually put it in our thermal vacuum chamber, pumped it down to Mars atmospheric conditions just to see if we could make this thing fly and actually control it with the closed loop control. And we did. So this is the, the test that we did uh, back in January of this year. And that's at 1% atmosphere. Uh, so we've continued to test it. We've can, now we've, you know, we've kind of thrown in some wind in there to make sure it can handle the various winds we expect on Mars and so on. Uh, but it works. We're building the flight model now, and that'll be a component of the Mars 2020 rover when it lands uh, in 2021, launches in 2020. Can the dust affect it in terms of Does dust the dust effect? affect it? Um, uh, you know, the dust storms we think will, you know, we want to be on the ground if there's some huge dust storm coming. But 
you know, you can see the legs there and the, the engineers have tried to design it. So again, at 1% atmosphere, you don't get a lot of force, even though you may have high velocity winds. So uh, we think we'll be okay. Yeah, but we did look at all those things based on what we know about the weather on Mars. Uh, we talked about the asteroids. This is another mission to the fourth largest asteroid called Psyche. Psyche is very interesting and we want to go there because it's an all-metal asteroid. Uh, you, know, you think of asteroids mostly as, as rocks and stones and those kind of things. This is all metal. And so the scientists think that it's actually a planetary core. So over time, the surface has been stripped away through asteroidal bombardment and so on, so you don't have any of the soil and the rock on top. All you've got left is what's left of the core. And so this would be, give us the ability to directly examine the core of a planet. So uh, that mission is, uh, we're designing that right now for a 2022 launch. And then uh, I talked about those water moons. This is the water moon around Jupiter called Europa. Uh, it's an icy surface, as we've said, but beneath that is liquid water. And you say, well, how does this stay liquid? Well, it's um, because of the tidal forces on the moon from that huge planet Jupiter. It kind of compresses and expands as it goes around Jupiter. Uh, and that's enough to create enough heat on the interior of that moon to keep the water in a liquid state. So scientists think there's probably two to three times the amount of water that the entire Earth has beneath this icy surface. That's how much water is on this moon. So pretty incredible. So we're designing missions to go orbit that moon as well as land on that moon uh, in 2022, and this is probably more like 2026, uh, but pretty exciting work. So. Now kind of stepping away from missions and thinking about technology, you know, these are some of the questions that we have to ask ourselves because, you know, every time you go into a mission and you think, okay, well, how do I do this differently or this is a hard problem I don't know how to do, how do I bring new technology to bear on that? Uh, so, you know, these are some of the questions we ask because, you know, the project managers don't want to take risk. You know, they say, now I want to use the tried and true, I want something that's been proved before. I don't want to take the chance of doing something new. I want to just make sure my project will work. But sometimes either you're driven to new technology because none of the current technology allows you to do what you want to do, or we can improve what you want to do with some of this new technology. So, you know, we think it has to significantly enhance the mission. Uh, it shouldn't add a lot of technical risk, but there's going to be some. You know, we want it to be at a high level of maturity and has to be demonstrated. So these are all things that you know, it's always an interesting discussion and battle about how do you infuse innovation and technology into your missions uh, because there's always going to be some level of risk and how do you play that risk down, how do you buy it down, those sorts of things. So that's one of the things that we think about. And uh, so the area I'm going to focus on here briefly is just a lot of the work we're doing in miniaturization and capability of sensors that we never had before. We've already talked about Marco, the one going to the moon. Uh, and again, that took some work to develop these very small radio receivers and a brand new antenna capability that allowed us to get, you know, with a small form factor, get enough signal back to the earth that was useful. And so uh, that was technology we had to develop for that. Uh, this is an interesting mission we're going to send up to the moon called Lunar Flashlight. And we developed the capability to use lasers to shoot down onto the surface of the moon in four different bands. And based on that information and how that light comes back can tell us what the components are beneath us. And ice and water reflect differently than other components. And we have a radiometer on board uh, that will then distinguish uh, if there's ice that these lasers are hitting or is it just rock and dust and those sorts of things that you commonly find on the moon. So very interesting capability that we've developed and that's going to launch uh, in 2020. And uh, as I said, both really in the Department of Defense and, and certainly in JPL and NASA, having the ability to create these small instruments uh, is really going to, I think, change how we operate in space. Instead of building these huge spacecraft, uh, we can now build smaller spacecraft with just as much capability from an instrument perspective to do a mission. Uh, so this was a tunable laser spectrometer that was on Curiosity, the rover. And now we've developed something that's a third the volume, half the mass, and, and has 10 times more performance in a smaller package. Uh, you know, magnetometers are big things for us. Uh, when we put them on spacecraft, we measure the magnetic fields around planets. Uh, and we've gone from this side to this very small uh, magnetometer that can fit on a, a one cube CubeSat, which is about this big. Uh, so uh, 
again, important capability. Spectrometers are also important for us because uh, we want to measure the chemicals that are on other planets or in the atmosphere and those sorts of things. And so uh, you can see this is kind of uh, what's currently on the space station to measure the air in the space station and make sure it's good quality air. And this is where we are today. This is somebody's hand holding these spectrometers that essentially do the same thing, uh, four times less mass, eight times less volume, uses six times less power uh, than what we currently have on the station. So uh, the ability to miniaturize is really making dramatic changes in how we think about doing these missions. Uh, I don't want to dwell a lot on this, but uh, this is a CubeSat that we launched back in May. It's called RainCube, and it's the first radar on a CubeSat. So this is a K-band radar, and, and the key thing was, number one, figuring out how to build an antenna that you could cram up into this CubeSat and then deploy it successfully. And number two, bearing, building this very small uh, K-band radar receiver uh, that would operate at a CubeSat level. And so we developed those capabilities, and what this does KA band is very sensitive to rain, precipitation, so uh, the, the KA band will reflect off precipitation and, and what we do is we fly over clouds and we can then look inside the cloud and see how the rain is forming, how the precipitation is forming inside the cloud with this spacecraft. And we've already demonstrated that and it's given us very good science data. So, uh, and then there's a whole host of other things in terms of uh, telecom, CPUs, FPGAs, all have dramatically changed over the last 10 years, really over the last five years. And that has to change your thinking in terms of, okay, how can I use this new innovative technology and capability to get my mission done in a different way? Less cost, uh, you know, on the DOD side, less visible, whatever the case may be. And I did want to highlight this. This is actually a partnership JPL has with our Air Force to develop the next generation high performance space flight computer. Uh, we've been flying our radiation-hardened computer called the RAD 750 for 10 or 15 years, uh, and we really need a new generation. So uh, we're right in the middle of developing this capability. It's got a bunch of cores that you can add or subtract from. Uh, you can see it's 100 times more computational capability for the same power budget uh, than what we're flying today. And that will dramatically improve our ability to do autonomy on board spacecraft, have machine learning on board the spacecraft, all those kind of things we think about that this will enable us to do. And of course, 3D printing, additive manufacturing, uh, we've got a lot of work going there. And in fact, uh, down in Melbourne, I'm gonna go to uh, a CSIRO uh, place where they're doing some of this and we're partnering with CSIRO on that. Uh, but this allows you to do things that you can't do with normal machining. And we've already taken advantage of that with some of our designs. But teaching your engineers and your designers to think about how you design things differently because in the past they said, well, there's no physical way I can make this part to look like this because it has to be machined and those kind of things. But with 3D manufacturing, you can make a part to look like anything you want. And they're, they can be highly complex, they can be very convoluted. And so you've got to teach your people to think differently about, okay, how would I design this if I had the capability to build this very strange part and additively manufacture it? Another area that uh, one of our guys uh, has a whole host of patents on is uh, essentially what we call, I call amorphous metal. So it's taking metal and infusing it with different components and putting it together in a unique way that for this, pur this purpose, it has the strength of a metal but the characteristic of a ceramic. So we're looking at the ability to build gears out of this material because it's a ceramic-like material, it doesn't have to have lubrication. And lubrication is a big deal on our rovers. We've got a lot of mechanical moving parts that have to be lubed, if you will. But if I can have a, a material that has a ceramic quality and doesn't require lubrication, that's a big deal. So, uh, so we're working on that. And then finally, uh, laser communication. Uh, important for the high rates of data that we're now experiencing uh, from our spacecraft. Will be even more important when ultimately humans start to go back to the moon or go back to Mars, and they want to get high-definition video back to Earth, all those kind of things. So we have an experiment on that mission going out to that fourth largest asteroid, Psyche, which is a laser receiver and transmitter. And uh, we'll be able to demonstrate laser communication from the asteroid belt back to the Earth. 
Uh, and we're going to use two of our telescopes in California to receive those bits, uh, those photons, and uh, show that communication capability. And someday we hope to have that capability here at Tibandela, uh, the, the deep space network site that we have here in Australia outside of Canberra. And that's, we're looking at developing hybrid antennas, which they're still RF capable, but they have these optical receivers inside the antenna that will allow us to do both laser comm as well as RF communication. And uh, we've talked about most of these, so I won't dwell on this, and that's the end. So we've got a little bit of time for dialogue and questions. But again, I want to give you some sense of kind of the military structure and how we operate, but also kind of my current day job and some of the technologies we're developing there and hopefully stimulate some of your thinking. Yeah? Thanks very much for your presentation. You mentioned that uh, partnerships were very important. Mm -hmm. um, of course, there is a, an international body that's very interested in space. And I'm sorry, that's what? The United Nations. Oh, yeah, yeah. They're interested in the ethical use of space. Mm -hmm. Um, I would say they're useful uh, because they set parameters, they set norms of influence or norms of behavior. Uh, you know, there's a lot of discussion, you know, 10 years ago about space debris when the Chinese did their ASAT and those kind of things. And, and so I think the UN had a role to play and said, hey, we need to all think about, you know, norms of behavior that we're willing to follow. It may not have the course of law or a treaty, but at least it's an organization that kind of looks broadly and, and helps that. Uh, there's, an is, there's an institution, kind of falls under the UN, although not exactly, but uh, the Committee on Space Research, COSPAR, which has been in existence since the 50s, and they meet uh, every year to talk about all the science work that's being done in space, kind of under this broad UN umbrella. So, um, you know, we follow the treaties. You know, there's the Outer Space Treaty and those sorts of things. So I would say it's, it's useful. Uh, but it's kind of ingrained in how we do our business. It's not like it's a big deal one way or the other. Because there's just standard norms that are out there that we, we try to follow. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, we generally, we have a, something called the micro devices lab. So yes, we can, we've got the laser etching capability uh, down to small microns and those sorts of things. So we, but we don't produce, you know, a hundred of these things. So usually a, a mission will come in and say, hey, I need this capability. Uh, can you design and build something that will meet my requirements? So we're able to do that in-house uh, with that micro devices lab capability, but it's not a production capability. But we have, you know, one of the things that we can, we, at JPL, we say that we do, I mean, we can do from beginning to end. So we can do the project formulation, we can do the design, we can do the parts manufacturing, we can do the board manufacturing, we've got machine shops that can do the mechanical work. I mean, we'll send stuff out, don't get me wrong, but uh, we have that internal capacity to do all that, put it all together, test it, launch it, and operate it. Yeah, the new, the new um, uh, computer, uh, the high-performance spaceflight computer, we actually are partnering with Boeing on that. Yeah, so uh, we kind of did the initial design work and said, here's what we think we need. We went out to industry and said, okay, tell us what you could do. And then that was kind of a co competition that Boeing was successful in winning. So we're working with Boeing and the Air Force and JPL to ultimately uh, put this capability together. Yeah. Yes. Uh, you probably heard of a company called SpaceX. Oh, yes. <laughs> I know Elon. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I will tell you what drives Elon is he ultimately wants to go live on Mars. I mean, I've had dinner with him, you know, that's what he says. He says, you know, I'm doing all this so I can go live on Mars. SpaceX, Tesla, you know, the solar cell guys, uh, that's his ultimate objective. So, and I believe him, you know, he wants to do, do that. 
Uh, is that possible in 10 or 15 years? I think it's possible. Uh, you know, one of the big issues with going to Mars is the human physiology. You know, as we orbit the Earth on the space station and so on, we're still under protection of the Van Allen belt. We don't get these incredible cosmic rays that are zapping us and all these kind of things. So as you go to Mars, you lose all that. So you've got to figure out, how do I protect the human body so it's not extremely damaged? Uh, you know, shielding, water shielding, whatever, but that's not solved. Um, so there's a lot of human factors that have to be dealt with. You know, he's building his big Falcon rocket. He just opened a plant down in Long Beach there in Southern California to start doing that. You may have seen the news about the Japanese billionaire that's going to get the first ride around the moon on the big Falcon rocket, you know, those kind of things. And, you know, Elon's pretty audacious, and he's a marketeer, and he likes to come out with all these bold statements. And usually they don't get done on the timeline, he says, but they do get done. I mean, he tries to drive to success. So I don't think it's uh, out of the realm of possibility that it may not be 10 years, it may be a little longer, but uh, he's driving to do that. Yeah. Okay, so um, I was expecting a bit more about technology disruption. I was wondering if um, you find that uh, because of the way you know, it's been done in the USA and, and the amounts of money, like there are issues like some cross buyers, uh, dependents, you find that there are some, there's a lot of space stars up there now, and you think sometimes, oh, they're, like they're approaching this issue in, in a way that's We've been doing meaning. Well, then just your, your approach to solving problems. Yeah. Um, you know, innovation is always an interesting topic, uh, and disruption by technology is always an inter interesting topic. I think, you know, the U.S. has a very good ecosystem of developing innovative technologies uh, because you've got, um, number one, right now you've got all these billionaires who are in the game, right? You know, Virgin Galactic uh, with Branson, and you've got the Jeff Bezos with Blue Origin, you've got Elon, so trying to disrupt that whole market. Um, but you've got a lot of venture capitalists who are always out there looking for where can I invest in this new technology, get in on the ground floor, and yeah, 10 of them don't pay off, but one does, and it pays off 100-fold kind of thing. So I think there's just a very strong ecosystem in the U.S. that, that encourages that sort of thing, provides funding for that sort of thing, and from a regulatory environment, it's pretty good in terms of starting up a small entity and getting it going. It's, you know, I talked about the amorphous metals there, right? That's pretty disruptive. Uh, and uh, uh, you know, the scientist at JPL who came up with that, he's got patents on it. You know, Caltech helps with all that, so he protects his IP, and he has the rights to this stuff, and so on, and then he's gonna probably start his own small business, you know, to get that going. So, there's just a whole ecosystem, both I think in the university side, in the venture capital side, uh, that looks for these new ideas that can be disruptive and tries to get them going and get in on the bottom floor in hopes of a good return on investment. Uh, so, uh, and you don't find that as much in Europe, for example. I don't, you know, there's some venture capital work, but it's just, it seems like it's a much harder nut to crack there. Uh, I'm not sure about the Australian environment, to be honest with you, in terms of how that all plays out. But, and if you look at, for example, the space venture capitalists over the last two or three years, it's dramatically gone up. Uh, so there's just a lot of interest in some of these capabilities from a space perspective. Uh, and then you can talk about uh, autonomy, AI, machine learning, big data. These are all things that we're dealing with at JPL. We've got teams that are you know, really focused on some of these hard problems uh, because we do want to be on a leading edge of some of these things. Uh, and it's, it's all about uh, getting the right people uh, with the right structure. You kind of saw a little video on innovation. Uh, it really is, in many ways, uh, the environment in some respects. You know, you have to have that environment that allows people to take risk, that gives them funding for crazy ideas sometimes that may or may not pay off. And so you got to create that environment in an organization as well. Yeah. We talked about the secret sauce at JPL. I think that's one of our secret sauces is that environment. Yeah, you and then I'll come back. So your, uh, the data that's generated by a lot of these uh, satellites, mm -hmm. both in there for Earth and outer space, sure. is, uh, is that readily shared? Absolutely. Academics uh, yep. amongst uh, researchers? Yeah, NASA's policy is all our data is available. That's mm -hmm. NASA's policy. Now, if you're an investigator on a particular instrument doing some really cool stuff on Mars, you may get first rights to that data for six months or something like that, so you can do your analysis and write your papers and get published. 
but at some point in time, all that data is out there. So we have data centers uh, around the U.S. for earth science and different components of earth science and oceans and things like that. And you can subscribe to those things and reach in and get the data and do whatever you want to do with it. So that is NASA's policy in general is that data is available. It may, there may be some time lag to allow the scientists to do their initial work, but it's always put out there. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so yes. you mentioned that uh, JPL has obviously had a great track record and likes to pursue that cutting edge type yeah. of Yeah, yeah. We have a, a whole structure to do that. Um, and we have multiple methods of doing it. So uh, if you've got an idea that, you know, may take $40,000, $50,000 to get going, you can submit a two-page summary of what you want to do, and we can improve that in two weeks, you know. So, so we want to have that agility, and, and again, we've got a structure of people that review it and say, yeah, this is great, let's do it, or no, it needs more work. And, and we kind of just tear it up from there, all the way up to what we call JPL Next, which is like a $10 million investment, which is like, okay, this is going to be extremely important to our future, and it's going to take some money, and we're going to invest in it for several years. Uh, the one we have right now is called OWLS, Ocean World Life System. And it's the ability to go out and have one instrument that can detect life, which we don't have today. So, so it really is kind of a graduated set of opportunities. And you may start off with, I've got this cool idea, give me 50K, I'll flesh it out for six months. Oh, it looks really good. Then you can apply for the next level, you know, and it takes a little more, you know, paperwork, if you will, to justify, okay, now I've done this and let's go and I need, you know, 500K, you know, to go off. So, and that's a very robust ecosystem there at JPL, but, but it can be pretty agile in terms of those initial seed corn ideas can get approved pretty rapidly just to say, okay, let's look at this real quick and see does it work or not, and then we'll take it from there. Yeah, but we have a structure to do that. Yeah. Yes? Uh, I'd like to know if the, um, the Robert Shaw uh, EM drive, the cavity um, uh, microwave thrusting drive, is that, is that fact or fiction? Is it, um, there was a media release saying that NASA I don't know if they put a couple hundred million. That sounds kind of high to me. Uh, <laughs> uh, is it real or fiction? You know, number one, I'm not the expert on that. We don't, we don't necessarily get into that part of NASA too much. So I'm just, I know what I've read. I, I would say, you know, it's one of these moonshot things. Uh, it's probably worth investing some amount of money to see is there really a there there. Uh, I wouldn't invest a hundred million unless, uh, unless there's things I don't know. But uh, yeah, so I don't know for sure. Probably only got time for one more question if anyone's got a burning question before the general leaves. I guess I just wanted to ask if I can. Yeah. Um, observing trends with, with all this and that, I'm noticing increasing trend move to cube sets. Yeah. And yeah. I think we're kind of skipping what they're calling small sets yeah. at the moment. Looking forward from your perspective, the mixture of small, Leo, up to Geo, Exquisite, and do you see that? Yeah. Yeah, I think the jury's still out. I mean, I think, you know, the big buzzword certainly in the U.S. right now from a military perspective is resilience. You know, how can my systems survive if they're under attack? If I've got one big battle star and it goes away, that's bad. Can I, you know, break it out into aggregate subsystems and those kind of things? So uh, I think there's, you know, still the jury's still out in terms of I think you're going to see definitely more small sats and cube sats. I think as the technology allows us to start you know, aggregating them together. I, I didn't talk about one of these missions we're going to do. It's six CubeSats uh, that have radio receivers on them that are going to measure these in RF pulses out of the sun when we have coronal mass ejections. But they're going to fly in formation, but the technology allows us to not fly in really very precise formation, but we can kind of put it all together with the software once we get the RF energy into these spacecraft. So, so we're going to be able to do a lot more of that with these smaller, small and CubeSats, uh, small sats and CubeSats. But there's, you know, if you look at like our spacecraft that go out to let's say Jupiter, Saturn, you're still going to want a big behemoth to carry a bunch of instruments because you get one shot every decade to go do something like that. And you want to carry as much science and capability as you can. 
plus we're not under threat. So it's a little bit different dynamic with uh, the Defense Department in terms of, okay, I have to think about the threat, I have to think about, but I still need capability, how much can I get out of an aggregated CubeSat constellation versus a large spacecraft? And I think technology is gonna still change that over time, and it will evolve. But you're still gonna probably need some bigger systems, you know. Yeah, yeah, okay. So, um, on behalf of the Chief of the Air Force, I'd like to present you with this coffee table book, which is a bit of a history Great. of our Air Force. Um, hopefully you can fit it in your excess baggage. Oh, yeah. And um, uh, if you could all join me in thanking the General. That's it. That's it. Yeah, good yeah. yeah. Thanks, folks, and I uh, hope you have a great, innovative day.